I guess um, we'll just start off by just a quick ex explanation of why you're here oh. and who's asked you to come out. And <laughs> uh, this is a fellowship that um, was set up by the Reserve Bank together with uh, Victoria University. Uh, they have an academic come here I think once a year to uh, give lectures and uh, have meetings with people from the Reserve Bank and the Treasury and, and the uh, University, and that's what we're doing. Okay, sure. And um, it's quite interesting your work that you've done in the past. There's, uh, there's also a public lecture which uh, is going to take place this Friday. Uh, actually, this sorry, yes. this is a public Thursday. Yeah, there's a public lecture that will take place this Thursday. I'll be coming. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, so, so your work sort of uh, fits into the New Zealand context, but yeah. quite well as you're talking about generational clashes and, and fiscal gaps. Um, right. Shall we start just in, in 2004 with, um, with your publication, The Coming Generational Storm? Um, so, so what did you say in that book and, and what's your thinking behind all that? Well that was a study of the generational policy in the US with some reference to other countries but basically the uh, analysis that I and my co-author Scott Burns did back then in that book uh, showed that we were running, a, had been running a Ponzi scheme starting in the 1950s, taking from young people, giving to old people, and uh, promising young people that they would get what they provided to the old people, plus a whole lot more when they hit retirement, that they would have their turn in expropriating the next set of generate the next young people. So this is a a game that's been going on for six decades now, and. In 2004, we looked at the magnitude of it and the implied uh, burden on future generations because in America, as in New Zealand and other countries, we, we know that aging is occurring because the end of the baby boom, the baby bust, and also because the level of these transfers to the old people have gotten bigger and bigger. So you, don't have, you do not have enough young people making enough money to cover these promises. And these promises have been kept off the books. They haven't been they've been uh, made in such a way as to not show up as explicit debt. So these are implicit debts. So my 92-year-old mom, for example, uh, has been promised her Social Security benefits for the rest of her life. And that's a real promise that's actually, in some sense, a, 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 a firmer promise by the U.S. government than to repay the official debt. Okay. Uh, at least in real terms. We could have inflation that devalues the, the official debt, it re, in effect reneges on it, but my mom's Social Security benefits will continue to come. That's the last thing they would cut. So these massive promises are off the books. This and is your then, fiscal gap. Yeah, this is the fiscal yeah. gap. So we measured this in 2003, uh, and this was not something we just did then. I mean, I'd been engaged in this project to do generational accounting and fiscal gap analysis really since 19. 89 or so uh, by myself and with some co-authors and this was just kind of summarizing the situation in 2004. It looked terrible. Now I just wrote a new book called The Clash of Generations with the same co-author. It just came out a couple months ago. It shows that this terrible situation in 2004 got dramatically worse. That the country is completely bankrupt and that we have a fiscal gap that's 211 trillion dollars large and the official debt is 11 trillion. So you can see that the true credit card bill the country's facing, which you know, is much, much bigger than the official debt, so that almost all of our true liabilities are off the books. Mm. Now, these this are these is unofficial spending commitments. These, yeah, these oh. and these projections uh, that are underlying the fiscal gap calculation of 211 trillion are coming from the Congressional Budget Office. Mm -hmm. I'm just taking the numbers and doing some algebra to them and figuring out how big the, the picture is. If you said, what is the bill? If we paid it off today, how big would it be? It's 14 years of GDP. Mm. And another way of expressing a $211 trillion uh, fiscal gap is that uh, we need to raise, uh, to pay it off by raising taxes, we would have to uh, raise all federal taxes, corporate, personal income taxes, payroll taxes, excise taxes, estate and gift taxes, 
that whole path of revenues that's being projected now would have to be 64% higher starting immediately and continuing forever to come up with $211 trillion in present value. Now, I know of no candidate on either side of the political aisle that's talking about raising taxes by 64% forever starting this year. And the other option is to cut spending by 43, by 40% uh, percent immediately and permanently, all non-interest spending. Okay. They're so, not the only options that are there. You've got a well, few, um, few ways to try and fix this, there are, which, you've, which you've put out in the latest book. Yeah. We have a set of, of policies. We call them purple plans because they're supposed to appeal to red Republicans and blue Democrats, and red plus blue equals purple. So one of the big things that we propose is to have a health care system that doesn't drive the country broke. The current system, as projected by the CB, the Congressional Budget Office, uh, is going to from uh, spending 10 percent of GDP at the government level on health care to 23 percent. Under our plan, we keep it at 10 percent of yes. GDP. So, so what does the system look like then um, under your plan? Under, my, under our plan, we take 10 percent of GDP and we give it to each American in the form of a voucher. So each American gets a voucher for, uh, and the size of their voucher is equal to their expected health care costs uh, under the basic plan. So we have a panel of doctors and we tell them, look, this you are uh, going to design a basic plan. You're going to decide what's covered. And the, you're going to give everybody a voucher to have um, the right to have insurance coverage for the basic coverages in the basic plan. And the cost of all these vouchers, therefore the, the expected cost for each person added up across everybody, cannot exceed 10% of GDP. Okay. So here's your, here's your problem. Uh, decide whether or not this MRI is included in the basic plan. If, uh, if you include it and, uh, and everything else you want to include, and then you figure out how much the voucher should be for each person, uh, and that exceeds 10% of GDP, you got to get rid of that MRI. But you decide, because you're the experts, as to what is the best basic plan that's affordable for 10% of GDP. Mm -hmm. We put everybody in the country in this basic, in the same system. We get rid of Medicare, we get rid of Medicaid, we get rid of employer-based health care. Everybody gets a voucher. They go to the insurance company. The insurance company can't turn them down, but also if you have diabetes, for example, you're going to get a bigger voucher. So the insurance company will have no incentive really to turn you down because you're going to come, even if you're sicker, you're going to come to them with a bigger voucher. So the big problem in the health industry, in the health, health area, in the health market, which is adverse selection, goes away because people are compensated for their bad information. The fact that they've got a disease, that they've had bad luck or have bad genes, they get... so. This so is a way of staying within 10% of GDP, and it would eliminate 60% of the $211 trillion fiscal cap right there. Okay. So that's one of several different purple plans that uh, you can read about at the purpleplans.org. It lays them out. Sure. And so um, just in terms of that voucher, that would be paid out, paid for by the person's previous tax. That would be paid for by the government, yeah. The government would uh, collect taxes under the purple tax. It's a new tax reform proposal. But we t we collect taxes, and everybody, and we would spend uh, some of the tax money on uh, <clears throat> on these vouchers. The vouchers go to the insurance company. The insurance company sends the voucher to the government. The government sends them a check. Now the insurance company is on the hook for the year to cover that person. And anything so above that, they have to pay for the, themselves. Anybody uh, who wants to have, for example, angioplasty at 98. That would not be covered by the basic plan. They would have to buy a supplemental policy to cover their their need for that. So, this is giving a very good basic plan to the entire population. So it's not public health care. It's really? public health care, but it's um, it's not micromanagement by the government. The government's not deciding <clears throat> which hospitals to build, how much to pay the doctors, which drugs should be uh, should and should not be brought bought. Uh, it's, I mean, there is a panel that's going to decide what drugs will, will not be covered, but uh, again, you can get supplemental policies. So there is some degree of, of government rationing here, if you like, but there's much less micromanagement than you would have here in New Zealand or in the UK or in Canada. Okay. And I'm not saying that you have uh, a bad healthcare system. 
uh, at all because you're not going broke with your healthcare system. So that to, to, to right away, uh, well, fiscal, fiscal gets getting a bit. Yeah, you've got your fiscal. Either. You've got your fiscal <laughs> uh, challenges here, but they don't seem to be anything uh, as anything like uh, the challenges that we're facing. But uh, but we haven't. Uh, seen for sure what this, the story is. The Treasury has to do fiscal gap accounting here because uh, it, has yet, it hasn't been done of late and it needs to be done so that we can see whether the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Key, is right that there's no need to immediately to, uh, to raise taxes uh, or change the spending or increase the retirement age. Uh, but what if he's wrong? If he's wrong, then what he's saying is uh, that we're going to make the next generation pay a bigger price. We're going to take all the burden of that hit and leave it to the kids. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that he can, uh, if he's wrong, and the only way we can find out is to look at the numbers. And and that requires putting together this fiscal gap analysis. and that, and my sense from talking to folks at the Treasury is that uh, you have a fiscal gap that's, uh, uh, that's not zero and that you need to um, uh, deal with it, but it's much smaller as a share of GDP than our fiscal gap in the U.S. But we need to understand that the longer we wait, uh, the more of a burden we leave to our kids. This is not a freebie. Mm. This is a zero-sum game, generationally speaking. If there is a fiscal gap, and it, if it's one times GDP, which uh, rather than 14 times GDP, and my guess is it's about two, one to two times GDP in, in New Zealand is my sense, uh, then that's actually not such a small number. Uh, a year's GDP is is a year's GDP. So. Are we going to make New Zealand's five-year-olds pay a year's GDP? Their the the newborns. Uh, which one of uh, Mr. Key's kids and grandkids does he want to pay much more than he pays? That's the question that he needs to answer. That's the question that every politician needs to answer. This is not a joke. This is very serious business. This is not a political football. This is: Are we going to leave a bigger burden to our kids? And if we're adults, if we're running a country, that's the first thing we have to answer. If we're thinking about fiscal policy, is are we being responsible with respect to our kids? Okay, it's not about getting reelected. It's about or the next election. It's about the next generation. And, and you've said this has been going on for sixty years. So, yeah, what kicked it off, and why hasn't it been addressed or seen, or why isn't there? There's obviously not the political will. See, to do anything about it. So partly it's bad accounting. Partly, uh, the accountants uh, allowed uh, all this, uh, these obligations be kept off the books and never started screaming. You're so not looking at future. Right. Shakespeare future. said first, uh, in one of his plays, he said, first shoot the lawyers. Uh, he should have written, first shoot the accountants. But there's something deeper here besides uh, the accountants were told what to do. The Congressional Budget Office is ordered by the Congress to to put out the numbers the way they put the numbers out. The, the reason I think that uh, we've been engaged in this uh, take-as-you-go take policy, take from the young and give to the old, uh, is because we have a very heterogeneous population and old people don't view young people as their own kids. So in our country, we have the older people being a majority of, of the majority of them are white. The younger people, a majority, are black and Hispanic. And in about 50 years, our country's minority will be the majority. Mm -hmm. So we've got older white people uh, thinking, gee, should I take a hit in order to help younger black and Hispanic people? And that may fundamentally be what's causing this generational ripoff. But it's going to blow up in the faces of older people, especially the baby boomers, because the younger kids don't have enough resources. They've been ba they're being badly educated. It's not just uh, the fiscal bills we're leaving them, but we're leaving them with a pretty bad education and also very high tuition costs. 
so, and also a lousy economy thanks to our, our terrible banking system. So there's a lot of things we have to fix and we have to act like adults. It's time for people to realize that this Ponzi scheme is at its end and we have to fix it. But it should have been at the end after 10 years, it should have been at the end after 20 years as yeah. the younger generations become uh, into the ruling classes, if you like, when they, when they get into being right. president and, and Congress, members of Congress. It, just, it seems they forget about it. Right. I mean, well, I've been writing been about this for, uh, since 1984. I've been saying that the deficit accounting, that the debt, the deficit, uh, that these measures are meaningless from an economics perspective because how we label government receipts and payments is completely up to up for grabs and we're choosing labels, we're choosing words to describe this taking from the young and giving to the old in ways that it doesn't show up on the books. So we're not saying to the young, let's let me borrow some money from you and I'll pay it back with interest plus something in the in, in addition. We're so, and if we did use that those those words then that borrowing would show up in the books. Instead we're saying I'm taxing you, but don't worry about this. It's called a tax, but in the future, you're going to get this back with a whole lot more. So that's the game that we've played to keep it off the books. And so why do you think it is? That's not, not to say we. The government has. And the politicians have used this uh, labeling trick so that they wouldn't have to acknowledge to their supporters that they were actually ripping off their kids because maybe their supporters didn't want to have that told to them. So why do you think it is coming to an end now? Is it because of the baby boomer bulge and, and at yep. some point their children are, are going to be the most squeezed? Well, if you look at the numbers, they're just getting worse and worse. And clearly the bond markets and don't understand it because they think American bonds are the safest in the world. And clearly the public hasn't been yet informed. Uh, my, uh, my book with Scott Burns hasn't become a bestseller. It's not... Uh, it's, I think it's well written, I think it's a fun read, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not something that uh, the press even seems to want to write about in the U.S. Okay, is this, uh, does this um, yeah. show how strong the lobby sector is then, effectively, or, or why, why is it? Is it it's some general apathy. Yeah. Uh, it may be that the press think that the politicians are not going to act responsible, therefore they don't have any obligation to tell to, to report honestly how bad the situation is and they're just going to go along and talk about the wrong numbers. I mean, this is an emperor's new clothes thing. We've got an, a, a fiscal policy that's going, driving the country broke. The country is literally bankrupt and the reporters and the politicians are all pretending that things are not so bad, that we're actually in worse fiscal shape than Greece. Our country is in, in the worst fiscal shape of any developed country in the world. You do fiscal gap accounting for Greece, for, uh, for Italy, for Spain, they're all in better shape uh, than we are. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as part of your, your plans, we've gone through the, the healthcare stuff with the voucher, uh, tell me about your, your tax plan. You're not, you're not too fond of well, we have tax, a, are you? We have a tax system that's uh, a mess. You know, we've got taxes within taxes within taxes. Uh, nobody can really understand it, uh, uh, the tax system. And we also have a corporate tax, that's the personal tax. The corporate tax is another big mess that doesn't generate much revenue. I think it burdens workers because when we raise corporate taxes, corporations leave to other countries and then they leave the workers behind. So I think the corporate tax, uh, it, even though uh, the Republicans think it's falling on the rich. I and many other economists think it's falling on poor workers. Workers, okay, in general. So, because companies, yeah. So, so the corporate tax is not helping uh, to make a, a socially equitable tax system. The the income tax is highly regressive. We see that Mitt Romney and Warren Buffett are paying very low taxes, uh, and then. Uh, we've got an estate and gift tax which collects very little revenue and but employs an army of lawyers. So and we've just got rid of our one here actually. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm saying is uh, as with uh, health care, let's start with a clean slate. Let's get let's do it. the patient needs open heart surgery, doesn't need band aids. So here I would say let's get a roll get rid of all the taxes we have, 
and have three simple taxes with a top rate in each one 15%. So it's a 15-15-15 plan, but it's highly uh, progressive. So I take the payroll tax and I make it highly progressive by getting rid of the ceiling on the tax so that the highest earn everybody's tax on all their earnings and I tax earnings up to $40,000 at half the rate of 15%, about 7.5%. Uh, so now you've got a progressive payroll tax, which we don't have now. Mm -hmm. And then I, I take, um, uh, I would start taxing consumption through a sales tax, a retail sales tax, with an effective rate of 15%. And as part of taxing consumption through a sales tax, I would also tax the consumption services we get from sitting in our homes and, our, and using our airplanes and our yachts and our cars. So all durables are throwing off consumption services. So and I would tax. Would you, how would you tax those? Well, like an, an annual uh, property tax through that mechanism. Or a yacht tax. If you yacht, a yacht tax, yacht. yeah, excise tax, right. So everybody pays 15% on the imputed rent, on the on imputed consumption services from their durables. So now you're taxing all of consumption at 15%. And then to make that progressive, uh, first of all, consumption tax is actually much more progressive than than most people think because Take somebody like Warren Buffett. He's got, let's say, thirty billion dollars. Uh, if uh, if he's interested in buying steak, he loves to eat steak, from what I understand, in an Omaha restaurant. Let's say he can go and make a deal and buy thirty billion steaks for a dollar each. And today he's about to do that. And I put on my consumption tax. Well, he would end up because the price of the steak would go up at the at the restaurant. He'd end up with fifteen percent fewer steaks. So taxing consumption is taxing what's used to pay for consumption, which is wealth plus wages. So Warren Buffett has wealth, so taxing consumption uh, is like taxing his wealth. Indeed, he's in exactly the same boat as if I just take 15% of his wealth away and leave the price of the steak the same. Now you might say, what if he doesn't buy steak at all? Suppose he uh, intends to give his $30 billion to his kids. Well. Since the prices are all going up by 15%, uh, the purchasing power of the money he leaves his kids is going down by 15%. So from day one, he's got the same number of dollars, but their purchasing power has dropped by 15%. So whatever he leaves his kids is going to be 15% less purchasing power. So this is a, mathematically, this is no different from just grabbing 15% of his dollar bills and leaving prices unchanged. So for people like Nancy Pelosi, who's the uh, speak, uh, the minority uh, leader, she's a uh, you know, Democrat in the House, she thinks a consumption tax is the most regressive tax in the world. We economists think it's, it's what it is, which is a wealth tax plus a wage tax, and if you want to tax the rich, a consumption tax is a great way to do it. Now the other part of this purple plan is to have a demogram, a monthly payment that each household gets that uh, it's a monthly check based on your household size and it's big enough so the people living at poverty will have enough money each month to cover all their uh, sales tax payments. So the poor will pay not, none of this consumption tax. People like Warren Buffett will be out 15 percent of their wealth and and will have a very broad-based consumption tax. And then the other tax is a 15 percent inheritance tax on inheritances and gifts received beyond a million dollars. So now you have three taxes. Nobody has to send in an annual tax return. You pay your tax at the store. Your employer sends in your payroll tax. There's no annual tax filing. There's no corporate tax. Now we have the lowest corporate tax rate in the world. It's zero under what I'm proposing because uh, foreigners then can uh, say, hey, do I want to invest in France where there's a corporate tax of maybe 20%? or the U.S. where there's a corporate tax of zero, let me invest in the U.S. Sure. This can help turn our economy around, and uh, and so that's my uh, purple tax plan. Yeah. And so how do, you, how do you decide that low-income people, were, the, the thresholds, though, at, at what they are, have you looked? We, have a, a, we have a poverty line so that everybody would get this monthly payment, uh, even Bill Gates would get it, okay. but for Bill Gates it would be a pittance compared to his resources. But 15% of his wealth is effectively being taken away from him. Uh, 
everybody gets the, uh, but for the poor people, it's going to be enough to wipe out their consumption tax liability. Mm -hmm. okay. How do we go from this being a Ponzi scheme to it not being a Ponzi scheme? Is How there a way to end it? Because effectively, would, would one generation just have to take well, a hit? The whole idea here is to get rid of the fiscal gap. And so the purple tax plan would generate more revenue and the purple health care plan would generate would, would entail much less spending and the purple social security plan which is a fix for social security would entail much bigger much very big savings in that area and together these uh, three plans would eliminate the fiscal gap and put us in a position where each generation will set, will pay the same tax rates over their lifetime so that's what you're really trying to get to with generational equity to end the ponzi scheme is to have a fiscal policy going forward where the tax rates don't have to be raised through time. And that's the question for New Zealand. That's the press question for governor, for the, uh, sorry, for the prime minister uh, here and for the other politicians. Do, are we on a path to have the same tax rate for our children as we're paying? If we're on a path to raise their tax rates compared to what we're paying, that's generationally inequitable. That's, that's part of the Ponzi that's part of the pon that's really what I would view as as in some ways a Ponzi scheme and as if it's bad enough if we're going to really leave the kids facing much higher tax rate rates than we're facing I would call that fiscal child abuse okay so let's um, why don't we just grow the cake for everyone and import a whole lot of young migrants well migrants uh, bringing support, immigrants support, put the the yeah. large support base for bringing in new immigrants. Uh, we've studied that in the U.S. and it turns out it doesn't really help the fiscal gap. It doesn't hurt it much either. It's about a break even. The problem is that new migrants uh, come with costs. They, you're going to uh, uh, require extra police uh, protection for them, uh, extra street lights, you know, housing, okay. public, push, public goods. Pushing up the population as well. Yeah, there's uh, extra public goods that are required, and then they will be paying in taxes, but they're also going to re getting, be getting transfer payments. So unless you get really high-skilled migrants to come in, uh, and a lot of them, you're not going to make much of a dent to the fiscal gap. Okay. Let's go into the, your Social Security plan. Okay. So uh, what, what do you see happening there? What should be happening there then? Well, that, that's relevant to uh, New Zealand because I know that you have a superannuation concern, whether your system can uh, sustain itself, given your demographics. And uh, we have that problem in the U.S. Our system is uh, on its own 31% uh, underfunded. So just Social Security by itself, the whole country is bankrupt, uh, the whole government is bankrupt, but Social Security by itself is also bankrupt. Uh, now. What I would do is uh, freeze the old system in place and pay off everything that's owed as people retire, pay off all their accrued benefits. But I would shut down the old system at the margin and I would set up a new system. And if I were in charge of New Zealand, I would do this probably for New Zealand as well, which is I would have every worker contribute, let's say about 8% of their pay to a personal account. But before it goes into the personal account, it would be divided between one's uh, spouse or legal partner. So if you have a, let's say you have a wife who's not working, staying home watching the kids, uh, half of your contribution goes into her account. So if you become divorced, she has the same size account as you. And same thing with any money she earns. Half of her contribution goes into your account. Now, then the government would make matching contributions on behalf of the poor okay. uh, so that we would have social solidarity. Okay. Now you've got everybody with an individual account. If you're unemployed, the government contributes for you. If you're disabled, the government contributes. Everybody has an account. Doesn't that just encourage you to be unemployed? It's well, that same old argument. Well, uh, there are some, uh, you know, unemployment benefits might continue for a certain period of time to let people get back to find a new job. And at that point, they might either decline or stop. So that would encourage them to get back to work. But uh, anyway, now everybody's got an account, and then the question is what happens with it? I would have it invested in a global market-weighted index of stocks and bonds and real estate by a computer, not by your financial community, not by your banking system, which is going to charge high fees. Uh, if you've got a social system, which we're trying to design here, you don't want Joe 
uh, having a great retirement because he chose uh, a really good broker, uh, and F Sally, who chose a really bad broker, uh, or you know, end up with a lousy retirement. Uh, everybody should have the same retirement. Everybody should get the same rate of return. Uh, the government should guarantee a zero real return on this uh, investment. So they should put a floor under under uh, how poorly you could do that. They should guarantee that you, at retirement age, you'll have at least what you put in adjusted for inflation. Sure. So this yeah. is like in New Zealand, we have a private savings scheme called KiwiSaver. Right. And the government is just trying to build that up as well right. as a complement to universal super. Right. So you but would the KiwiSaver involves you going to the banking system and paying for them to uh, make money for you. Yes. Okay. That's not what I'm proposing here. I'm t saying uh, take a... Uh, so it's one big default fund, basically. It's just one, one, one big index fund that uh, everybody is going to be investing in, and it's going to be run by a com single computer. You're going to get, take a MacBook, a, a nice American computer, a MacBook Air, MacBook, um, an Air, you sure. know, it's a little thin... <laughs> uh, Macintosh computer, Apple computer, and you're going to uh, take some big room in some huge government ministry, and you're going to clear out everything, and you're going to suspend that on these very thin wires, so it just looks like it's floating in the air, and it's going to do all the investing, and it's going to show that the banking system is not needed, because it's not needed for this. Mm -hmm. And that same little computer is also going to do the conversion of people's account balances when they hit... 60 on a cohort basis between 60 and 70 their account balances would be gradually sold off uh, all the money of people that are 60 that year would be pooled together and gradually sold all their their global index fund holdings would be gradually sold off and uh, transformed into inflation protected pensions that continue until they die and the way that would work is that uh, if you're 60 uh, let's say we uh, you and everybody else who's 60, uh, over the next 10 years, we start converting. Your, uh, uh, we sell off your, your, your shares of the, the global uh, portfolio. We put them into, uh, uh, we buy uh, inf government bonds, inflation index bonds with the proceeds. And then the people that continue to live in your cohort are going to get paid out from these, uh, from the principal and income from the inflation index bonds and over to, and that's going to form your annuity okay. and if people die they get nothing the people that survive will get more money because of uh, the people who die have lost out be well they're in heaven they don't need money okay so that's just uh, a simple way to have annuity insurance and if more people live because there's a cure for cancer mm -hmm. less will be paid out per survivor so there's no liability to future generations. Each cohort would be on its own. So this is a fully funded system. The only risk to future generations is this government guarantee, and I think that's a minimal risk. I think that the world financial system will generate at least a zero real return over somebody's lifetime. Uh, you know, even in the in the uh, if you invested in a. Uh, an index fund of bonds and stocks. Your stocks did really poorly over the last decade, but bonds did quite well. You would still come up with a positive return uh, over the last decade. Why are the youth angry? We've, we've seen riots in, in the Middle East. And, you know, in France, they get together to throw rubbish at the parliament every so often. Right. In America, specifically, and I noticed this in New Zealand as well, it seems that it's very apathetic stance of of younger generations. The American kids haven't learned what their parents are doing to them. They haven't been told the truth. They haven't been, nobody has explained to them that what the government has in mind for them is to uh, pay dramatically higher taxes or face a world with very high inflation. Uh, and apart from that, the government has allowed a, a financial system to operate that has taken down the economy. So people are unhappy uh, because they can't find jobs. A lot of people borrowed a lot of money to go to college and now they can't get jobs. So there is some underlying anger here. It hasn't really expressed itself yet. But Will it? Can it? Well, I think it 
it could could arise in the form of uh, maybe a political party that represents young people, and the, it hasn't happened yet. And we have uh, a lot of attention being drawn to issues that are not uh, generational issues. We've got abortion rights. Uh, uh, so is this to do with, you know, could this also be like ownership of the media or those fantastic bugbears that the media you know, focuses on these two parties? Like, yeah, they focus on these uh, the questions that the politicians want to talk about. They're not there saying to the politicians, you know, in Table Four B Six of the Trustees Report of Social Security, it shows the system is thirty one percent underfunded. I've yet to hear that raised in the debate. Uh, I don't think it's going to, in the debate between Romney and Obama, I don't think any of the reporters are going to ask that question. Aren't you running as well? Well, I was running, there was a platform called AmericansElect.com. It was a uh, internet uh, web-based platform to allow people like me to run for president. Uh, unfortunately, what happened was that I, I was running with other people for the candidacy, and this organization pulled the plug on their uh, platform about a month ago. And what they, I think they were trying to do is get somebody like Bloomberg with a lot of money to come in and make their thing a big success. So rather than supporting people like me who are not that well known uh, and don't have a lot of money, uh, the board said, gee, we haven't seen Michael Bloomberg come on board, therefore we're going to pull the plug. And that's what happened. So unfortunately, I was a presidential candidate. I've got a website, kotlikoff2012.org. I also have the purpleplans.org, which is a platform. And uh, they're still up there, but I'm no longer um, going to be able to have you for, uh, for lunch in the, uh, in the Oval Office. How disappointing. Yeah. So how, how are these, uh, we don't have much time left, I guess, but how, how are these purple plans going to get out there? Who's going to pick them up? Has there been any interest in anyone picking them up? Well. I'm trying to spread the word and get people to endorse them, and people from all over the world can go and endorse the Purple Plans, not just Americans, but anybody who's interested in the U.S. Uh, and these plans actually work for any country, so it's not just kind of, it's, there's also a plan, Purple Plan, for fixing the banking system called Limited Purpose Banking. Yes. And the Purple Health... mutual funds. Yeah, the, I'll, I'll explain that in a second, but the Purple Plans have been endorsed, uh, some of these have been endorsed by a number of Nobel laureates, like the Health Plan has been endorsed by five Nobel laureates. The Purple Financial Plan has been endorsed by seven Nobel laureates in economics. So I'm hoping that over time we get a lot of economists and others uh, to endorse these plans and then the press, if we have millions of people endorsing these plans, then we get the press to pay attention, but that's a long haul. I'll just say briefly what the Purple Financial Plan is, which is called Limited Purpose Banking. I wrote a book called Jimmy Stewart is Dead, yes. which uh, describes this. Uh, now quickly, who is Jimmy Stewart and why is he dead? Okay, Jimmy Stewart uh, was uh, an American actor, a very famous American actor. He played George Bailey, a, a very honest uh, banker in a small town uh, in the movie It's a Wonderful Life, which we see every Christmas in the U.S. It's a Christmas movie. It's about the townspeople running on Jimmy Stewart's bank because they have heard that he uh, doesn't have enough money to, to pay their, back their deposits, and they think they've been defrauded. And, of course, he has... Per participated in a lie. He's told everybody they could get their money back on demand. He said, here's a demand deposit. Here's your checking account. You can always get it back. And of course, he didn't have the reserves to cover that because he lent them out. So he becomes despondent. He tries to kill himself. He's rescued by an angel. He gives a really good, who convinces him to try and change the situation by telling people not to take their money out. He gives a great speech and he saves the day, and it's New Year's, Christmas Eve, and everything's a happy ending. But you see the fragility of the banking system. You see that it depends on people trusting uh, an honest banker. We can't place our trust in bankers anymore. We don't have, whether or not they're honest, uh, they're not our friends, uh, they're not our parents, they're not, they've proven to a large extent not to be trustworthy, and they don't, they're not able to manage risk. So what I'm saying is, Let's change the banking system fundamentally, which is to have uh, all the banks operate as mutual fund holding companies that issue, do one thing, they issue 100% equity finance mutual funds. Where they're also called unit trusts in the UK. And the way that works is each mutual fund is like a little bank. It takes in money, it hands back shares of stock 
to the mutual fund, and then the mutual fund invests in what it's specialized in. So in the U.S., we actually have 10,000 mutual funds, more than the number of banks, who are investing in all kinds of things, junk bonds, treasury bills, uh, New Zealand stock, uh, you name it. There's 10,000 of them, and not a single one of the equity finance mutual funds got into any trouble. So if we run all the banking system through mutual funds, we'll have no financial collapse anymore, no possibility. And the other part of this proposal is to have a federal agency uh, verify and disclose all the securities that the mutual funds are, are buying and selling and holding. So there won't any be, be any more liar loans or no-doc loans or ninja so loans. So these mutual funds are basically the, what banking is supposed to be as intermediaries? Yes, yeah. The, it's limited purpose banking. You limit the financial, the, the banks to their legitimate purpose, which is intermediation. You get rid of leverage because all of the banks are now running little banks that are 100% equity financed. They're not borrowing anything. And you get rid of opacity because you have this federal agency to disclose everything and verify everything so that people know what they're buying. So the two problems with the financial crisis are leverage and opacity this gets rid of them. If we put this in place today in Europe, in the Eurozone, we would end the sovereign debt euro crisis immediately. Things can still go wrong. If these mutual funds make, make loans and someone can't pay back his loan. Then. Well, the mutual funds might buy your mortgage and you might default on it. So the shareholders of that mutual fund might get hurt. But that happens all the time. People have shares of stock in the US and they lose money. Uh, but it doesn't cause a financial crisis. The problem. So the mutual funds might lose money for their shareholders, but they themselves wouldn't go broke. They would still be in operation. So the, the, you have to realize that the banks are running a, a public good, which is the financial system, and they can't be allowed to gamble with it. That's why bank failures are such a big deal. You know, we have 28 banks around the world get into trouble in 2007, 2008. We have a worldwide crisis because it threatens the financial system. And so we can't let the banks gamble with the financial system. They're, they're not run by Jimmy Stewart anymore. We can't trust them. He's dead. We need to have a financial system that cannot fail. And limited purpose banking is that system. Okay. Well, I guess that's a good place to end it. And so I hope you enjoy your stay in New Zealand. And hopefully you can <laughs> convince the Treasury to, to, to come out and, and get New Zealand's fiscal gap projections going again. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure they will uh, uh, produce these kinds of calculations, very easy to do. And then, uh, and then the Prime Minister needs to take a, a careful look at them and see what uh, is the proper thing to do because he's the chief adult in the country. He's not just the Prime Minister, he's the, the prime grown-up of the country. He needs to remember that. Sure. Well, Larry, thank you very much. Thank you.